There are many ways of actively adjusting a rocket's trajectory and orientation, some of which we have attempted to some degree over the years. But now our 2022 recruits team decided to try something we haven't tried before. So hello rocket fans and welcome back to the Copenhagen Suborbitals Rocket Shop, where we continue working on the world's only crowdfunded human spaceflight program and our rocket speaker. Our this year's recruits team is very software and electronics savvy, so they decided to take on the challenge of testing an active guidance navigation and control system on board their bi-liquid rocket, which will mimic the guidance of our speaker rocket. And what's a better way to start testing active guidance than starting small and failing fast? Today our 2022 recruits team is gonna do the first separation test on a very small rocket. It's the first time we've ever tried using this kind of small rockets. Usually we don't launch anything less than about a couple of hundred kilograms. But uh, since this uh, recruit section is focusing a lot on the uh, active guidance system, we figured that we could use cardboard rockets, which just became legal in Denmark by the turn of the year, as a very cheap and repeatable way of trying out this new guidance concept we have. You've perhaps seen it before, but we have this little section with canard fins we want to insert at some point, also in one of these cardboard rockets, so that we can fly it repeatedly, lots of times, and get a lot of uh, feel and uh, uh, results for how it's behaving. It's just so much cheaper to get it wrong on one of these small carport rockets than one of the big recruits rockets. So for today, we're just doing a separation test before this reference rocket is going out on its first uh, launch campaign. We have all the electronics that we intend to get into the, um, into the active guidance system. We have that inside the nose cone of this one, but there are no canards. So first time here, we're just flying a data logging mission to gather a lot of data on what we expect to see or what we expect the guidance system to see when we launch that for the first time. And just to make sure we got everything right, we're just doing a separation test and making sure we get the nose cone off, we get the electronics out and it survives the ejection, parachute deployed, and then I think we're ready to go fly. So let's see how this turns out. If you enjoy our videos on building a space program, you can help us out by becoming a supporter. We all do this for free in our spare time, so you'd be surprised how much every little bit helps. To fly your name to space on our speaker rocket, you can head over to our website www.copsub.com, where for as little as a coffee a month, you can fund the development of our boosters, rocket engines, and space capsules. We also have a merch shop there, and leaving this video a like also helps not only us, but YouTube's algorithm to recommend you similar content that you might like, so whichever way you can help, we appreciate it a lot. Now, the tethered model rocket tests show that its IMU system is fully functional and is able to record all the forces and events involved in the separation tests. The barometric sensor also survived the ejection charges, so everything worked as expected. The only thing remaining before the recruits are ready for their first untethered model rocket flight is getting a confirmation from a potential launch location and agreeing on a test date, so stay tuned for that. Apart from this test, we recently weighed our speaker rocket locks and ethanol propellant tanks to get a better estimation of the rocket's mass budget, evaluate how far we are from our target, and see how close we managed to get the tanks to match each other in mass. All in all, we were quite pleased to find out the weight difference between them was only 0.38%, which further confirms our semi-automated production approach can yield repeatable results. We are also pleased that our DSC rib, which would be a great vessel to aid in our sea launch and recovery operations if it had a working engine, now has a working engine. Now we're just waiting for it to get hot. Yeah, what do you want to test when it's hot? Whether or not the temperature gauge works. Okay, which one? So we want to test if this temperature gauge starts moving when the, the engine gets harder. So this is why it's running now? Yes. So this measures the uh, coolant temperature. And yeah. We also have a, uh, a alarm for it. Yeah. We have a, a dial for the uh, for the oil pressure. Yeah. And a alarm for it. Um, there's an alarm for the exhaust temperature that's measured in the 
down in the exhaust pipe. Yeah. We have the RPM meter running. One That's cool. 900 RPM. Okay. And uh, the hour counter is slowly ticking. It works. We saw it earlier. Yeah, it works. Finally. It's been a long haul to get it here. Uh, it's been many people who've been working on it. Mm -hmm. Me and Oliver got a lot of the last stuff done. We got all the easy parts where everything had been fixed and just had to be mounted. So we got all the last bits of the per periphery of the engine mounted and got all the um, things taken care of. We just need to change the oil filter now and then it's super new engine. Uh, basically everything has been changed. We have roughly two and a half engines in parts or combined, uh, but we have one working engine. It's been stuck on our workshop floor for a while now, so we can't wait to move it out and make some space for both the new recruits rocket as well as new sections of the speaker rocket.